So, uh, I will be talking about uh, kernels and how to manage your own kernel. Uh, there are people here that don't know me, so uh, for those of you, uh, my name is Marian. Uh, I'm system administrator since, uh, since 98. Uh, I'm building systems uh, as a system architect since uh, 2006 and I'm managing, uh, managing my own kernels since the first day uh, Crocodile installed uh, Linux on my machine. Actually, I had to recompile the kernel to make my machine work. So, <clears throat> obviously, uh, making a kernel uh, for me is not something uh, so strange or uh, hard that uh, everyone thinks it is. Uh, I hope that uh, for you it shouldn't be the same. Uh, it should be the same, but uh, my experience tells me that it's not the same. So now uh, there is a problem. Most of the people tell me that uh, it's extremely hard to compile a kernel. Uh, it's not hard. It's simply uh, you don't get enough information or you don't uh, know where to get the information from. Uh, this uh, talk is not about this. Uh, this talk is mainly about how, after you know how to compile your kernels, how to keep track of the changes that uh, happens uh, over the internet. And so unfortunately, uh, it's not easy at all. Uh, I'll start with this. It's not easy to manage your own kernels. It's very hard and uh, it's a lot of work, but uh, I hope that uh, my approach will help you uh, run your own kernels for this. So first, there's the basic definitions of the kernel versioning. Uh, there are three numbers. Uh, the, uh, the major number currently is three. It may change maybe in a few years. Uh, there is no uh, rule how this number changes, actually. The last time uh, it changed from two to three, Linus simply said, I'm feeling fine with moving to three, and that's it. <laughs> so uh, we have the major release number. We have uh, the minor release number. This is the most important part of the version uh, that you're interested in for the next few years. Uh, this is when a lot of changes are aggregated into a single uh, version code that is released as a single tarball. And this is the patch level. Uh, patch level means uh, after the major, uh, the minor release have been done. Uh, everyone have uh, received it, tested it, and found some problems with it. Uh, these problems are addressed uh, into uh, additional patch levels. And uh, these are more frequent, like every two to four weeks. So it depends on uh, uh, how often you update your kernels two to four weeks, you may need to change something. Uh, and uh, if you, you're going to manage your own kernels, please, please run your kernels on your own machine, your laptop, your desktop machine. First there, be sure to test it there and update there. There are more definitions that you need to know. First, uh, there are different types of kernels that you can uh, download. All kernels, are coming from uh, kernel.org. Uh, these kernels that are coming from there are called mainline kernels. So uh, for the mainline, we have stable kernels. This means that uh, every time a version, minor version uh, is released, it's considered stable. Uh, it's nothing else. This is the minor number. This is stable. After that, uh, we get uh, uh, additional patches for these versions. They are considered not stable. They're not branded stable, but uh, uh, since this is the major, uh, the minor version, uh, we, we call them also stable. Uh, they're least candidates. These, I advise you not to run on a machine that uh, you care about the data. <laughs> uh, because uh, release candidates are uh, when 
Linus or some of the other maintainers uh, pulls a patch that is pristine, haven't been tested uh, a lot from anyone else than the developer of the patch itself. So uh, what happens is that sometimes, for example, with uh, BTRFS, uh, early adopters of BTRFS were very unhappy with a few uh, release candidate versions because they lost all of, your, uh, all of their data uh, when they removed a file or uh, added a directory and stuff like this. So this is a problem. And release candidates are good to see what's changing. Uh, is uh, the change working for you? But <laughs> don't run release candidates in production. Uh, I have done uh, this mistake of running release candidates on uh, uh, production machines. Uh, I have personally checked all the lines of code in the uh, release candidate patch before I decided that uh, I want this uh, patch to be on my machine. Uh, this takes a lot of time, but it solves you a few nasty problems that you may see. And also, uh, as we will see by the end of the talk, uh, warning the patch is very important. Uh, then you have Linux Next. Uh, Linux Next uh, is uh, similar to release candidates, but uh, it's a simple Git branch that uh, is a Git repo that is uh, supported by a few people. They pull everything that you give, uh, give them. Uh, if they know you, they pull from you. So uh, Linux Next is the most broken uh, Linux kernel that you can run. If it runs on your machine, nice. Report this to the maintainers because they need testers. And the last version is uh, long time support. These are the kernels you're mostly uh, interested in. Uh, these are kernels that are supported for two years. What, the, what this means is that uh, you have a team of a few developers, uh, maybe are depending on the version, they may be between two to five at maximum. And these guys are backporting all the patches, security patches, from the new versions of the kernel to this release that they are supporting. Uh, usually, Red Hat are doing uh, long time support. Uh, SUSE are, have two maintainers for long time support. And uh, Debian have uh, one maintainer or two maintainers for long time support. Everything else uh, is done by the community, and uh, you cannot expect any support there. I mean, someone to backport a patch for a version that is not long, long time supported. Uh, the long time support is, as I said, two years, and that's it. From the time they choose a kernel, and picking a kernel for long time support uh, depends. We'll see uh, about this. Uh, there are different types of kernels also, distribution kernels. These are different from the mainline kernel. These guys here apply patches that are not accepted by the uh, mainline kernel. These guys uh, have uh, strange uh, logic for their patches uh, because uh, they are driven by enterprise, meaning that if uh, Dell tells uh, our Red Hat that there is a problem with a certain controller of theirs and sends them a patch, they will apply this patch, but this patch would not go to the mainline kernel. So this kernel may actually support that device a lot better than uh, the mainline kernel. The same happens for Debian and SUSE. Also, there are uh, another type of kernels, that's uh, the uh, project kernels. Like, uh, how many of you know OpenVZ? So for the others, this is a container technology that is very old, but uh, for now and for foreseeable future, uh, future it will not be accepted in the mainline. So uh, they uh, have their own kernel, separate kernel that has all of their patches. And uh, they're releasing it the same way uh, the kernel uh, kernel.org does. So these guys have different kernel that may not have these patches or may not have so, uh, some of these patches. It may not uh, have long time support. They may not uh, add uh, backport any patches to uh, these kernels. So why the hell would you need to rebuild a kernel? Uh, most of the kernels from uh, your distributions actually work perfect on your servers, on your laptops, desktops. Why would you go through the hassle to maintain your own kernel? 
Uh, one situation is that uh, distribution kernels are um, a little bit slower in adapting certain security features uh, like uh, live patching, like uh, uh, new uh, features of the kernel that uh, allows you to get uh, uh, better security inside your machine. Also, certain uh, CVs are firstly fixed in the main line uh, and then uh, you get like a week or two uh, before they release uh, a patch for a new version of the di distribution kernel. So it takes a lot of time. Uh, I personally uh, build my kernels uh, for better performance because uh, all of these uh, distribution kernels, they are built with all the modules uh, supported in the kernel, everything. They should run on every hardware. Uh, while I run my laptop or my servers uh, and most of you that run more than one or two machines, you know that uh, you try to get your hardware to be as, uh, to have as few hardware uh, com uh, combinations uh, as possible. So uh, instead of uh, building a kernel for uh, 500 different types of hardware, you usually need to build a kernel that runs on uh, one, two, or three different combinations, and that's it. So for these, uh, you can get better performance, uh, a lot better boot time, uh, because uh, usually with uh, my kernels, uh, I subtract like two to three seconds from the boot of uh, each kernel, and I'm talking only for the kernel, not for the unit part and everything after that. Uh, the kernel, it's slow in booting. And uh, most of the uh, initialization in the kernel is still uh, sequential. A lot of the uh, work in the past one or two years is uh, to make the uh, initialization of uh, the kernel structures parallel. But it's very, very hard. So uh, making a kernel that has uh, fewer options uh, sometimes gives you better performance when uh, starting. Uh, the kernel is a lot more secure when it doesn't support a lot of features. Like uh, there are a lot of protocols that you don't use at all, like SCTP, DCP, the stuff like you may not have heard that uh, exist, but you still have uh, this support in your kernel. And the problem with that is that when a new uh, CV uh, pops up, you actually have the software that uh, it attacks. When uh, you build your own kernel and remove all the shit that you don't need, actually you have a, a smaller attack surface, so you don't need to mm, care about a lot of the CVs. Like, uh, we work through uh, all the CVs every Monday, and uh, there is... Usually, there are a lot of kernel bugs in there, usually, but uh, uh, n most of them we don't care about. We don't have the driver for this specific uh, uh, video card or for this specific uh, storage controller, simply because we don't have that controller. And uh, if we don't have it, why, why would we put the drivers inside our kernels? Uh, also, there is something for some people uh, having a kernel that is entirely monolithic, meaning that uh, it doesn't have modules at all, uh, is uh, a good security model uh, that I also support. If you can have a, a, mon a monolithic kernel on your machine, I would prefer it. My uh, laptops are all with monolithic kernels. So uh, there is a problem, as I, I'm saying here, uh, Software right and uh, LVM doesn't work with uh, monolithic kernels, but uh, you can fix it. Uh, fix it uh, by adding a lot of uh, strange features in your init system. Uh, also, supporting custom drivers. Uh, there are hardware implementations that are not exactly like the one that they copy. <laughs> And the drivers from these uh, Japanese, Chinese companies, uh, uh, they're, they try to fix the driver in the mainline kernel, but most of the time their developers are shitty and uh, they, uh, their changes are not accepted. So you need, in order to run your hardware, you actually need to run their uh, code. And this is a problem because uh, obviously 
you cannot trust their code because the mainline doesn't trust it. <laughs> but uh, if you have bought this hardware and uh, the only uh, way to use this hardware is to use their, uh, mod, uh, their drivers, you need uh, a custom kernel sometimes. And uh, some of the features uh, that are not included in the mainline, uh, this is the main reason, and I'll have additional slide for that. This is the main reason to uh, go to a custom kernel. Uh, there are also some features of the kernels that uh, are disabled by default uh, for uh, your distributions kernels, or they are enabled by default. Uh, like, uh, m I don't know for distribution that doesn't uh, uh, enable SE Linux, but uh, if you don't use SE Linux, well, why would you have all the infrastructure for SE Linux in your kernel? I have to tell you that SE Linux actually uh, slows down your kernel considerably, so uh, removing it uh, when you don't use it uh, is a very good practice. And for this, you build custom kernels. So, uh, for the custom drivers, you have storage uh, interfaces, network interfaces. Sometimes uh, uh, you trust the code, like uh, it comes from LSI uh, or from Dell, uh, but uh, they still, their developers, their way of developing the drivers was not accepted in the mainline, and for this, you would never run mainline driver with the same performance as uh, the driver from, for example, from Dell. And for this, you would uh, build a module, additional module that uh, is supported only for this kernel. But uh, sometimes when you're, and uh, this is from personal experience, uh, when you want to run a specific version of a module from like LSI, for example, uh, it needs to change some kernel structures, and in order to change these uh, kernel structures, you need to build a custom kernel. So, fuck, you have to uh, build it uh, by hand. Uh, also, uh, vendor supplied drivers usually uh, work for a specific version of a kernel. Uh, they don't move from that uh, version of the kernel uh, often, like uh, every two years, uh, which is not very often. Some of us uh, change, uh, change our kernels like every six months. <laughs> so, uh, this doesn't happen very often, this change, but when it happens, you know that you have built a custom kernel and from now on you have to support it, and that's a problem. Uh, supporting certain Custom features that are currently not available in uh, the mainline kernel, but are accepted by the community as a whole, are very interesting. Like live patching, and live patching was a very. Uh, we have uh, we had a mini conference at Linux Plumbers two weeks ago, uh, just to uh, show these two and uh, uh, see what we can do with that. Uh, so. These are features that will come to uh, the distributions maybe uh, next year or the year after that, but if you want to use live kernel patching now, what would you do? You would build your own kernel and that's it. Uh, the Docker, I assume that most of you have heard of it, about it, it uses AUFS and AUFS is a very old file system, but uh, it is not accepted in the mainline kernel because it changes the mainline kernel in a certain way that uh, breaks other file systems that are supported by the kernel. So you, you would use AUFS, but uh, if you use AUFS, you would know that you have broken some things. Also BFQ, BFQ is uh, in development like for six or seven months and uh, uh, in testing for two, a lot of people including me are very happy with uh, its performance, but again, it. It will enter the mainline maybe uh, at 3.19, which may be a few months from now. So uh, if you want to build a kernel now and uh, support your machines with it, you have to patch the, your kernel uh, with it. And GR security, it's notorious. Uh, we had uh, previous talks at uh, OpenFest about GR security. If you want security that uh, doesn't require half of your uh, processor, uh, you go with GR security, and uh, those patches will never 
uh, Spender tells never go to the main line. He doesn't want to uh, think about including this, uh, this part of the kernel. So there are some problems with the custom features. Uh, uh, if you're using like, for, uh, let's say, AUFS, you have to check constantly if there is a new version of AUFS that is compatible to uh, your version of the kernel. They, the releases of AUFS are irre irregular. You don't know when the next release will come. Uh, you have to uh, join the announcement mailing list and be sure that uh, you read that information to know that you have to fix something with your AUFS and upgrade your AUFS in the kernel. Uh, most of the time, uh, something that is supported outside of the uh, mainline kernel is built uh, specifically for a certain version, just like uh, the hardware uh, uh, vendors, uh, software vendors built for a specific version. And if you want to go to another version of the kernel, you actually have to patch to forward port this, uh, for example, AUFS patch to this uh, kernel that you want to support. And it's extremely hard and uh, very annoying because uh, most of the time you know that the community should have done a better job at supporting their uh, project and had uh, have uh, closer releases to the main line. Uh, so, uh, sometimes, uh, for me personally, uh, was a situation where I had to forward port like uh, two uh, or three minor versions of the kernel up, which is like uh, seven or sometimes uh, 20 versions between the kernels. These change a lot. And uh, you have to spend like uh, 20 or more hours just to fix that, to make it build on your machine and be sure that it doesn't break your kernel. Uh, you. You have decided for some, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll talk about it. When you choose a kernel and uh, you have chosen it for a reason, when you support, uh, when you use like three or more uh, different outside projects, uh, sometimes they don't have a uh, version for your particular uh, liking and you have to work with that. So how to choose a kernel and that would work for you. Uh, you need to test it on your machines and uh, first re test it on your laptop, see if you like it there. Because uh, uh, sometimes the first experience of a person uh, is uh, the most important one for the kernel. If it actually works, uh, if most of the things that you work with uh, uh, in your laptop works, uh, then you are a little, bit, a little bit more confident to go to your servers uh, when you go to uh, reboots without actually seeing the machine, uh, uh, what's happening, and so on. So you need to test and test more. Uh, because without tests, uh, it wouldn't be very easy for you to go to this version. Uh, it's a mistake here. Uh, every minor release you have to uh, build. Uh, and I mean build it. Don't run it uh, every time, but at least build it. See if you can build it on your machine. Sometimes kernels don't build. And these are problems that have to be reported to the kernel developers. They don't know every time if it works. Uh, actually, the kernel tests for the main line are done on uh, less than 32 nodes. And on these 32 nodes, uh, there are like, uh, I think, less than 300 uh, virtual machines that do the build tests. And 300 is uh, not so random uh, as you would see, uh, as you would think. Uh, you, uh, it's a good idea to experiment with uh, versions that are not ending with zero. So if you have a minor version that is uh, zero or without the zero, uh, Try to skip it, if possible, because uh, usually for these versions, there were people uh, waiting a few months to get their patches in. And sometimes in the last minute, they decided to fix something that broke the whole implementation that uh, uh, a lot of people have uh, tested. So first and second releases, uh, uh, pre-patches uh, pre are the good parts usually. Uh, sometimes you have to wait even for six releases. Uh, but uh, usually the first and second are good enough. Uh, 
Uh, this is not a hard rule, but uh, my experience is uh, close to this. So uh, try to use the long time supported versions uh, for your projects because uh, this way you have uh, less work uh, forward por uh, backporting patches from the mainline and you would need only to forward port uh, some of the th uh, things that you don't uh, uh, have in the mainline. Uh, test the performance. Performance is very, very important for all of us. And uh, if you don't test it, uh, you simply switch to the new kernel and it happens that it changes all the uh, figures that go out from your MySQL or uh, it slows down your Apache and stuff like this. So you want to be sure that at least the same performance, you get this, at least the same performance from uh, your kernel. Uh, you in the performance part, this is a big problem for kernel developers. Actually, uh, for the past two years, uh, there were at least four talks between kernel developers and application developers, um, meaning mostly database developers, uh, that are thinking for how to load test a kernel. And this is not a trivial task. Uh, some would say, okay, we'll simply start a program that crunch numbers and this would tell us uh, if there is a problem with the kernel. Uh, the problem is that this may work on your machine, but uh, for a machine with uh, like 100 uh, processors, uh, it may not be a good idea to test the performance there because it's completely different uh, architecture, uh, completely different hardware. So you have to test with your own machine. That's uh, very important. And you need to break your kernels. If it doesn't break, uh, be prepared that it may break sometime. If you are able to break it and you know that it breaks there, at least you know that this is a problem for you and know the limits of your kernel. Uh, it's a problem when you have multiple hard drives, multiple CPUs, multiple of whatever. Uh, it's a problem and you have to test it. Uh, usually, uh, what, uh, what's a good idea is to have your like, MySQL and uh, run 100 instances of the same MySQL with the same queries uh, 100 times across all of your MySQLs on the same machine. Yeah, you would not have the uh, hardware for that. You would not have the memory. But this is where the kernel has to uh, work a lot more because it has to switch between, uh, do, I, do I have five kilobytes of memory here? Do I have one second of CPU time here? And this is the situation where kernels break. And if you can break it, you at least know how many MySQLs are required to break your kernel. There is no kernel that cannot be uh, broken. Uh, it will deny you service at certain limits. If you don't limit the users, the kernel cannot do anything because one of those users is root and he tells the kernel what to do. Uh, also, uh, Try not to compare 32 with 64-bit uh, versions. They're a completely different piece of software. Uh, most of the code has a lot of if devs just for this. So you cannot compare performance of those two. You have to compare 32 with 32, 64 with 64, and that's it. Uh, it's a good idea to test uh, the performance of uh, your current version and the next uh, version uh, in a row. And then uh, if you want to, uh, uh, to test between more versions, add uh, these versions in a row so you can see if there is a difference between uh, all of them and where the performance goes up or goes down even with a little bit. Uh, these are tests that uh, the PostgreSQL uh, guys do. Mm, if you compare the performance uh, uh, between, mm, okay, not major, minor releases, sorry. I'm used to, uh, the second number for me usually is the minor, uh, major, uh, major release because uh, uh, the major number doesn't change a lot. <laughs> so uh, between minor releases, uh, sometimes because there were like uh, 10 or 20 uh, pre-patches for uh, the kernel, mm, the performance may differ a lot because at the end, uh, different versions, uh, minor versions, include different 
additional code, maybe a new, entirely new feature. Uh, it's not only drivers, but they change like uh, the VFS scheduling, the IO scheduling, the CPU scheduling between these minor versions, which don't change uh, between pre-patch versions. So uh, this is important. You have to expect difference in performance between uh, minor uh, releases. So what I usually do to check the uh, performance, uh, I try to see if the world average stays the same or similar with this uh, old kernel and my new kernel. Uh, I check the shed stats, uh, which is the information from the hard drives, uh, uh, from the CPU scheduler. Uh, if the CPU scheduler cannot uh, cope with the same uh, workload, uh, it's different. I have to tell you that uh, when you're testing, after reboot, your kernel memory is pristine, so sometimes it has some uh, advantages. It has uh, uh, better performance when you reboot, and the performance degradates uh, like in uh, one or two days uh, because kernel, uh, kernel memory is ordered in the beginning, and uh, uh, a day or two after that, uh, it's a little bit more fragmented, and uh, access to this information sometimes uh, takes a little bit more time. And this is your close to life uh, setup for your kernel. You cannot uh, test it with a uh, world that after reboot the, uh, and without any world on this machine for the next 24 hours, it would stay with ordered memory. So <laughs> you need to uh, do something on this machine before you actually start testing the performance of this machine. The kernel. Uh, is no, differ, uh, no different than any other application. Uh, check if the memory allocation, I mean, but uh, when you are running, like, for example, MySQL database, you know that usually it takes, for example, you have configured to use like eight gigabytes of RAM, and you expect it to run with eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, if you change a kernel and it now takes like nine or 10 gigabytes of RAM without changing anything else, most probably there is an issue with your kernel and you have to report that because uh, it's expected to have the same memory mechanism, the same memory allocations. So it's strange to have uh, more memory for the same tasks. IO performance uh, is changing a lot. I mean, even between pre-patches, uh, sometimes IO performance degradates or uh, goes, uh, goes up. A lot of work is done uh, on the IO uh, scheduler and a lot of optimizations are done there. And this is why it changes a lot. So check it, uh, do something that, create a test that is repeatable for your workload. Uh, workload. You don't need to uh, test it with uh, uh, tests that are built by someone else because they build the, um, those tests for their infrastructure. They don't have the, your workload. Work uh, network uh, performance, uh, it's good to see if your uh, packets per second ratio is still the same with the same configuration. Uh, it happens to change a lot also, but uh, not so often as the I.O. Hardware functionality, uh, you would be surprised uh, uh, to see that sometimes uh, when you simply switch to another kernel version, uh, your wireless uh, no longer detects certain types of wireless, like A or B or N. It depends what they have uh, broken in the drivers. So uh, check your hardware functionality, because uh, for storage controllers, this is very important. You may lose uh, uh, functionality like, uh, like write back cache and stuff like this, simply because you upgraded <laughs> and this doesn't work in your current driver. Uh, software compatibility, uh, the kernel guys are uh, very, very careful, uh, careful not to break user space. This means that uh, they try not to break uh, glibc and uh, everything uh, that is directly exposed by the kernel. But it happens, and it happens uh, actually a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Michael Kersk uh, was a speaker a few years ago here, and uh, He's not only documenting uh, a lot of the things in the kernel, he's uh, one of the guys who actually tells the developers, you broke user space again, and it happens. <laughs> so you have to test your software if it works on your machine. 
so now let's get get our hands dirty. Uh, what we need to do is uh, have a kernel. Uh, I usually uh, have a repository that is directly linked to Linux and pull from there. Uh, you need to create a branch that is uh, named uh, like your uh, fe uh, feature that you're developing. So there is this dis distinction that uh, I need to make here. There are community patches that you would use, like the AUFS, uh, BFQ, KGraft, KPatch, stuff like this. These are huge projects. Uh, supporting those on your own is uh, very hard, and I don't advise you to do that. Uh, to do that. But sometimes you you have uh, seen in a mailing list a small patch that actually works for you, uh, or you have developed by yourself a patch for the kernel. Uh, it's a lot easier to simply have a branch for this new code, and this uh, branch I usually name it with the name of the feature, and then uh, dash the, the version, the specific version of the kernel that I, I built it for. So uh, after you have that, uh, this is the, proce the procedure that you have to follow. For, you have to check if uh, uh, this is scripted. You have to script this. Uh, I, I didn't want to show you bash scripting here because it's a lot easier to understand this than bash. <laughs> but uh, you, you have to script this. It's very easy. Uh, check if uh, your current branch name, uh, your current version that uh, you have with, uh, when you pull from uh, Linux, check if your current uh, feature has a branch that is the feature dash the same version. If you don't have that, you need to create a new branch uh, that includes the name of the feature and, the, uh, and your current version of the kernel. Then you check uh, if there is uh, a newer version again, just to be sure, because it happens. <laughs> uh, and uh, if uh, there is a newer uh, version, you uh, tag, uh, tag this, uh, get the tags. And uh, if there is no new uh, version, you get the tags, and that's it and you continue. If there are new versions, new tags in uh, Lin uh, Linux's repo, you simply need to check, that, uh, check out this in a new branch. Usually that would be JRSec. I'll show you this in a little bit more detail. I have added graphs. So uh, you create a new, uh, new branch. That branch, uh, actually you don't create the new branch. You, uh, Retag this branch. I had to update this. Sorry. So you have the version, uh, your feature, your uh, new version of the kernel. You either go with the new branches or tags. It depends. Uh, for branches, you follow the uh, everything that I have written. For tags, you follow the graphs. After that, after you have the branch, you need to rebase that branch. Uh, this. This branch is based on your uh, 3.17.2, like I have created previously a branch, JRSec 3.17.2, right? So I create a new branch that is uh, made from 3.17.2 uh, uh, and so rename it to 3.17.3. Uh, then after that, I rebase it based on version from the kernel 3.17.3. And if there are errors, this is the important part, after your base, and if there are any conflicts, you don't resolve the conflicts in your scripts. You simply send yourself an email with the information where these conflicts uh, are. And you can uh, accumulate a few of those emails before you start fixing it. It's not very important if you're not going to run that code. Uh, if there are no uh, errors, you simply commit and you have a version of your new feature uh, directly added to uh, of your new feature that is supported directly for the new version of your kernel. Uh, then uh, you do some cleanup from time to time because uh, these branches uh, tend to pile up a lot. Like uh, in my current repo, I have like 50 or 60 of these branches uh, that simply wire around. So here's the graph, if you want to do, uh, to do, to do the same with tagging. You have the master, uh, the master repo, uh, the master branch, and from it you usually uh, receive tags from uh, Linux. 
there that should be here, sorry. <laughs> so they come up, the versions come up, and uh, you usually start with certain release and uh, you base your uh, feature based on that release, right? So uh, you then change this target that you know that this is the version uh, that you ended up. Then uh, you rebase your, uh, your branch from here directly to here. If there are errors, obviously you, you would receive an email. If they are not, perfect. If you want to go to the next release, you simply tag this one. And why you tag this or why you create different branches? This is because if you want to go back to a certain version of the kernel, you would need to know which code of yours actually worked with which version. And that's very important for you. And so one other thing. Uh, add additional tags into your feature that uh, tag very big changes in your code. This is uh, good because you would know that between this and that version, uh, there was a big change X, and you need to add this uh, when you start to use, again, this old branch. So then you simply base again to the new version. It, have everyone understood that? Because this is the most important part. <laughs> so uh, the actual management, uh, uh, it works usually only with your own patches or uh, patches that are small. Because uh, if you try to forward port uh, a jar security, uh, I have done that, believe me, it's not fun. Uh, it's a patch that is uh, like uh, 30 megabytes. And uh, this is the patch file. <laughs> this is how many lines of code you have in it. And uh, it takes a lot of time to go through all of them. Uh, also, uh, keep a list of uh, all of your uh, patches that you add to a kernel. So the last part that I haven't included in the presentation is that uh, we in the company use a very simple bash script that says, uh, I need. Uh, feature X, Y, Z, and so on. And uh, what it does is uh, it creates a branch from the version of the kernel that we need to build to. Uh, to and in that branch, uh, it merges all of these features, and then it builds there. So uh, it's very easy to collect your features and add it to a certain version. If uh, you have all of these small branches uh, or tags for each version of the kernel, you can choose, I can pick uh, 3.17.4 and say, okay, I want feature X, Y, and Z uh, for uh, 3.74, and uh, I will get uh, this kernel with all my features that I want very easily without actually patching anything because if I have uh, read the emails and fixed everything, this should be clean. No conflicts at all. Uh, so if you keep this list, you simply need to uh, create this very small uh, shell script and build your uh, kernels. Uh, clone the Linux repo uh, because uh, he's the uh, dictator of the kernel, right? And uh, uh, usually the, uh, the last point where uh, code evolves to is his repo. So if you use like, uh, a version of the kernel from the OpenVZ guys, uh, it would be uh, behind Linux sometimes. Sometimes it may be in front Linux because they accepted some patches that he will not. But uh, this is checked by a lot of people. Uh, I would not say millions because they're more like 22,000, but that's it. <laughs> uh, so uh, you pull uh, from Linux. Uh, I usually uh, pull uh, uh, frequently. Uh, you can do it every hour. You can do it every day. I usually pull every day, but uh, it depends. Uh, it's on Chrome for me, uh, for my home machine. Uh, also, you have to build regularly. You need to build like uh, at least once a week to be sure that this kernel builds on your infrastructure. Uh, yeah, one other thing here, uh, when you build a kernel, uh, try to use the same uh, config. 
this is a bit tricky because uh, between minor releases, so 3.17, 3.18, there would be differences in the config file that's uh, accepted. So this is why I usually use old dev config because uh, uh, for the people that are used to building the kernel, uh, old silent config requires to, to uh, ask you a few things for the new features. And uh, believe me or not, <laughs> there are quite a few new features that are coming in uh, every uh, new minor release. Um, if the build breaks, you need to know about this so you can see what were the errors and try to fix them or report them. Most of the time, if you report your errors to the kernel community guys, they will fix most of the, thing for, uh, the things for you. So uh, it's a lot of help out there. You're not alone. You don't need to do this alone. But you need to automate this for your system and run this on your system so you can uh, easily report information to th those guys. Uh, yeah, I said that. Uh, uh, yeah, if you are going to upgrade uh, to, a, to a new kernel, uh, like every six months or so, it's a good idea that every two weeks you check for uh, errors from your uh, patches and fix these conflicts. Because uh, six months from now, there would be at least uh, seven or eight versions of the kernel and uh, these <laughs> versions are too different and uh, you would need to do a lot of uh, thinking for forward porting your patches. But between single uh, version, it's a lot easier. Uh, so for there is a problem with the CVs. Uh, when you are building your own kernels, uh, there is no Red Hat, no, no SUSE. They would usually uh, handle your new kernel with uh, the problem uh, fixed. In order to uh, handle this, you need to stay on top of CVs, uh, go look to uh, the kernel logs for CV something. So this is very easy. When you pull from Linux, you simply parse the log and check for CV. If there is a uh, patch commit that says uh, CV something, this is something that you you are very interested. <laughs> this is the easy way to uh, get patches from the community. If you don't see a patch for in the mainline kernel for this, most probably in the mailing list, uh, Linux kernel mailing list, there would be uh, patches for uh, this thing. Also for kpatch and kgraft, you can create your own uh, module for this and fix your uh, kernel very easily. Uh, do not try to monitor the Linux kernel mailing list uh, manually by seeing uh, all the mails or reading all the mails. They are like four to 8,000 emails a day, minimum. Uh, usually, it, there are days like Monday that you can actually get 22,000 emails in a day. So it's very hard to uh, walk through all of these emails. It's a good idea just to uh, be interested in uh, the architectural changes, uh, schedulers like uh, um, virtual memory scheduler, bio scheduler. Uh, so uh, what else? Uh, also, uh, there are no, uh, f there are other issues like the performance. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, like the Postgres guys, they find uh, find issues with the kernel, and uh, their performance fixes for the newer versions. And these fixes are sometimes reverting some code or adding a few lines just to fix a pro uh, problem that was introduced. Uh, these, uh, you, there is no easy way to find, and. Uh, Okay, I'm out of time, so uh, yeah. Don't go with uh, uh, patching assembly code. Even if you know assembly, don't go there. Uh, crypto stuff, uh, everywhere the crypto is very hard. Uh, questions? Mm, Mike, here. В слайда за тестването казахте да не сравняваме производителността на 32-разрядната и 64-разрядната версия. 
и това е разбираемо. Обаче вие казах, дадохте едно обяснение, че в ядрото има много-много ифове, където се проверява дали ядрото е 32 или 64 разрядно. Но ние знаем, че 32 разрядното ядро и 64 разрядното са различни ядра. Наистина ли се оставя кода за 32-та разряда и 64 и те динамично се сравняват и се изпълняват по време на изпълнение? И в дефове, макроси, на практика кода не се билдва. Нямате 32 битов код. Грешка. Не, не е точно така. Защото в кърнела, на практика в 64 битовите кърнели имаме функционалност да емулираме 32 бита, което е друго. И там обаче вече става много тарикатско, защото 32 битовите апликейшени работят в 32 битов режим на практика. Кърнела във всеки един инт може да сложи още един инт за кеф. Но перформанса на това нещо не може да се сравнява отново с 32 битовия и с цяло 32 битов кърнел. Причината пак, особено, че тук казвам емулираме, и то го пише, емулираме 32 битова операционна система. Т.е. само за да могат да работят тия бинарки. Не може да се очакваш, че ще работят толкова бързо, колкото на 32 битова или пък по-бързо. Други въпроси? Ай, uncertain Bulgarian. Any other questions? Sorry. Here. What's the procedure you'd follow? What's the procedure you'd follow if you have to use one of the distribution kernels? If I have to use the distribution yeah. kernel, uh, this is a good. One. Uh, sometimes you, uh, the company actually tells you that you need to use this kernel, and also sometimes there is the other problem. Your vendor tells you that you need to use this kernel because their drivers are only for that, and you're stuck with it. Uh, You're good with uh, of if you are with a vendor like Red Hat or SUSE, where they support their kernels for a lot of years. Uh, their their long time support is like uh, 10 years or 16 years. I don't remember. It depends how much you pay them. Uh, so uh, with that, you simply uh, go to uh, the vendor like Red Hat and uh, pull all of, the, all of their patches from uh, their repository constantly. And uh, one, one thing that I forgo forgot to tell you is if you are using third uh, uh, different community uh, supported uh, kernels like OpenVZ, AUFS and stuff, uh, stuff like this, it's a very, very good idea to have an archive of their data on your uh, premises somewhere. Because like, for example, JR security are notorious of keeping only uh, two versions of their patches uh, on their website. And that's it. So I made a script and I uh, have an archive of all of the Spangler patches uh, so I can build to a different version of uh, the kernel that is not supported, uh, that my vendor in this case, JR security doesn't uh, give me right now because it's old for them. So it's very easy. You pull from uh, the sources from Red Hat or Suzy, and uh, you simply rebuild them on your machine. It's the same thing that CentOS guys are doing, Mandriva was doing, and stuff like that. Any other? Uh, are, am I sure that I'm pulling from the vendor no, and no, not no. from uh, kernel? I, I summarize your answer. Yeah. You are just pulling from the vendor, not from kernel work. Yes, yes. Uh, when you are using uh, uh, you are uh, distributions kernel, you use the sources from that distribution. If this is the Debian, you go to Debian source repositories and pull from there. Uh, for for distributions kernels, uh, it's a lot easier because most of the work there is done by uh, the community about uh, around these distributions, so you don't need to do a lot of things. You need to write like make RPM after you download everything. <laughs> it's not very hard. Any other questions? Then thank you. <laughs>